Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, today's program is brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. You can support the show uh, by mail. Uh, on a one-time basis, to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And you can also become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month. Just go over to patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of The Silent Men. The original air date, De- December 23rd, 1951. And the title is Souvenirs of War. Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. in The Silent Men. The National Broadcasting Company proudly presents Douglas Fairbanks' production of The Silent Men. Transcribe stories of the undercover operations of the special agents of every branch of our federal government and their relentless fight against crime. Now here is Douglas Fairbanks. In the United States of America, a man may legally purchase a gun to be kept in his home for the protection of himself, his family, and his rights. This is a constitutional privilege denied in most other nations of the world. However, as crime records attest, not all guns are purchased legally. Those who would use a gun for evil purposes cannot risk the scrutiny that goes with legal purchase. They buy illegal weapons handled in the shadows outside the law. Guns bought to intimidate or kill rather than to protect. Against the traffic in illegal weapons, we have one defense. The silent men. Special agents of the federal government who track down the purveyors of illegal weapons. Tonight it is once again my privilege to play the role of one of these silent men. Special agent Paul Wellman. In the file case entitled... Souvenirs of War, in which only the names and places are fictional. It started in Detroit with a request from the local police. They were holding an 18-year-old boy, Billy Watkins, on a charge of murder. He'd killed a liquor store proprietor in a holdup. The federal government entered the case because of the weapon employed. Better come into my private office, Mr. Wellman. Thank you. It's quieter in here. Sit Mm. down. Ah, Thanks. That the uh, gun on your desk? Yeah. Ah. German Luger. Nazi army issue for officers. Your your lab been over this? Yeah, you can handle it. Uh Uh-uh. How about the slug? American ammunition, near as the lab can determine... Quite a few companies put out shells of almost identical caliber. Yeah. Not perfect fits, but close enough to kill a man with. Well, we've had a couple of other foreign gun cases. Like what? These. A kid killed in a gang fight a few months ago. The lab thinks the murder weapon might have been a Mauser. And here's another. Negro shot down while he was waiting for a bus. Mm. Witnesses saw a couple of youngsters barrel by in a hot rod when the shot was fired. Slug indicates a weapon of Belgian manufacture, according to ballistics. This kid, this um, Billy Watkins who killed the liquor store man, uh, he tell you anything? Tough one. Clammed up. You want to talk to him? Is he here? I had him brought in from the county jail this morning. I've got him in the bullpen. You got a private office I can see him in? I'd like to um, get him out of his cell for a few minutes. Sure. You go in here. All right. I'll get him and bring him in to you. saying nothing. My lawyer told me not to talk to nobody. As far as the charge of murder against you is concerned, he may be right, Billy, but I'm not interested in the murder charge. That's for the local authorities. I want to know about the gun that was found on you. Where'd you get it, Billy? I got nothing to say. Okay. Well, maybe we can talk about something else, eh? Understand you come from a large family, eh? Six. You're the oldest, aren't you? Yeah. 
I guess you've made your family pretty happy. I don't care whether they're happy or not. They'll get by. Oh, sure. sure. Looking at you through bars isn't going to bother them at all. Hmm. That's why you've refused to see your mother, isn't it? Why don't you leave me alone? That's the stuff. Be tough. You got a kid brother, 14 years old. Maybe he'll see what a big shot you are. Maybe he'll wind up sharing a cell with you for a few years later on. I don't care what you say to me. I ain't going to tell you nothing. Why should you? Don't spoil your kid brother's chances. Maybe if you keep quiet, somebody will put a gun in his hand someday and he can join you for good. You've been involved in a series of petty thefts, Billy, but never with a gun until this time. You threw away your whole life on that gun. It's my life, ain't it? I ain't kicking about it. You killed a man. You threw his life away. You threw away the lives of your mother and your father. Oh, let me alone. I asked you to leave me alone. Go ahead, ball. It'll do you good. (laughs) You want to see your mother? She couldn't come. She couldn't take it. You want to see her here, in this office, without bars between you? Oh, they wouldn't let me. You know they wouldn't. I could fix it. It might be the last time, Billy. The last chance for the rest of your life, without the bars. What do you say, boy? I... All I want to know is where you got the gun. I bought it. From who? I don't know. I never saw him. I don't know who he was. You going to stick to that? It's the truth. Oh, it's hard to explain. Try. I'm listening. Well, I had to put $50 in a locker in the bus depot. Go ahead. Well, then I took the locker key and put it in an envelope. I mailed it. Just like that? No address? It went to a guy named Harold Callan at the Hotel Sussex. You never saw him? No. Then what? Well, the next day I got a letter. An envelope come in the mail, and it had a key in it. Uh Uh-huh. For a locker in the railroad depot. I went and opened it, and the gun was there in a package. I see. Well, who told you to write to this Harold um, Callan in the beginning? A fortune teller? No, It was... Go ahead, Billy. A guy named Burton. Who's he? Fats Burton. He used to run a pool room on Lake Street before the war. He was in the Army, and Mm -hmm. he said the Callan guy was in the Army, too. That's how come he had the gun. It was a war souvenir. All right, Billy. The guard will take you back to your cell. You said I could have a visitor. You will have. As soon as I've checked your story. The story wasn't easy to check. Up to a point, we followed the lead Billy Watkins had given me, but it wound up against a stone wall. I went back to police headquarters. Got a report for you, woman. Good. You won't think so. Here it is. Here are statements from every employee of the Sussex Hotel. Isn't Harold Callan registered there anymore? He never was registered there. That Watkins kid wasn't lying to me, Chief. I didn't say he was. Nobody at the hotel ever heard the name Callan before? The night desk clerk might have. He's not sure. How come? Too many names to remember on a job like that. But uh. when he was going over the register with my men, he, he said he thought a man had stopped in one night and asked if he was holding a letter in the name of Callan. I see. Clerk said he did have a letter. You know, uh, sometimes mail comes to a hotel for people who are traveling, haven't reached the place to check in. Sure, sure. It's a good gimmick. As far as the clerk remembers, Callan said he'd planned to stay at the Sussex. That's why he'd had his mail sent there. But he had to go right back home because of urgent business. Yeah, that figured. Don't suppose he said where home was, did he? If he did, the clerk doesn't remember it. Looks like our only lead to Callan, if Callan is his name, will be through Fats Burton, ex-GI and pool room operator. No good, Mr. Wellman. Why not? Burton's back in the army. Oh. He re-enlisted and was assigned to duty in the Allied sector of Germany. Uh-huh. Went over last week. Oh, Great. I suppose you could work an angle and have him sent back to the States. Well, what good would it do? He's committed no crime, none that we could prove. There's the kid story. Sure, the word of a murderer against a citizen without a record, a soldier on top of that. No, Burton's out. We can't hold him. I had loose threads and nothing to tie them to. I tried to find a man named Harold Callan who mightn't even exist. Billy Watkins had made his contact through Fats Burton in the pool room circuit. I'd tried the same circuit. For weeks, I clicked balls together, sticking to the places where young hoodlums seemed to gather. Finally, I hit something. Say, that was a pretty nice shot, mister. Well, thanks. Want to shoot a game? Yeah, all right. Well, uh, 
What do you want to play? Rotation? Chicago? Or the black ball? You pick it. Rotation. Hey, Pete! Rack him up here, will you? Okay. Uh, loser pays, okay? Sure. sure. Now, how about a little action on the side? Well, you've watched my game. I haven't seen yours. Well, I don't think I'm as good as you are. Uh-huh. Nickel a point shouldn't leave nobody bleeding. How about it? All right, nickel a point. Thanks, Pete. All right. Toss to see who breaks? Fair enough. Yeah. You call it. Head. Tails. Okay. Bust them. He played off his game deliberately, keeping his score just a few points behind mine. On the second game, we raised the stakes to a dime a point. On the third, a quarter. He was letting me win, building it up, but I wasn't interested in his game. He was wearing a button-up sweater, and when he leaned across the table to make difficult shots, there was a bulge that had a familiar look. Ah, if I sink that one, I beat you. Now you get it. You're right. I get it. And that puts me eight points up. Two dollars. Okay. Here. Now, how about a chance to get even? Buck a point. No, thanks. I had enough. What do you mean? I want a chance to get even. I said I don't want to play anymore. What, do you take me for a pigeon? You're the one who suggested the betting. I've got a right to quit. Oh, nice. Nice when you've been winning all the time. Suppose you lost. And maybe you couldn't even pay off. I'd like to see. See what? The color of your money. Sure. Here, take a look. Satisfied? Yeah. I thought maybe you were a shark. Must be a hundred bucks there. Well, a little more or less. Well, thanks for the game and the money. Uh, wait a minute. I'll walk out with you. Time on table four, Pete. I'll pay you later. Okay. Uh, you live around here? No. No, I'm staying at a hotel downtown. Well, I'm going that way. I'll give you a lift. Got a car? Yeah. Parked on the next street. Let's go through the alley here. Sure. All right, this way. It's kind of dark and narrow, but it's a shortcut. Yeah, I understand. Oh, you! Keep your hands from under that sweater, boy. If you don't, you're going to get hurt. Listen, you let me alone. Let me go. Oh, I, I will as soon as I get this. <sighs> kind of dangerous toy for a boy your size. You a cop? Your questions can wait. Mine come first. You can answer them downtown. Now, get moving. But don't get smart. The gun was of Italian manufacture. Again, an army issue. The boy's name was Gene Shelby, and his story about getting the gun was the same as the story told by Billy Watkins. Money left in a locker, a key mailed, another key received. There was only one difference. Come on, Gene. Who gave you instructions for buying the gun? A girl. What's her name? Marie. That's all I know. Where'd you meet her? Well, she's a checkroom girl. At the stockade. At the dance hall. Marie Kinsey? Oh, I don't know her last name. I never asked her. You know the girl, Chief? I know her. Let's leave this boy alone for a moment. I'm sure he won't try to leave. Sit down. What about this Marie Kinsey? We've been interested in her from time to time. What for? The usual things. But she's also suspected of being a fence for stolen goods. Well, that sounds good. I thought so, too. She could use that check room as a clearinghouse for anything those young hoodlums picked up. And in her business, she'd also know which ones would be interested in buying guns. I can have her picked up. Uh-huh. No, no, no good. She's in the clear just like Fats Burton was. We have no actual evidence. She might get scared and talk if we brought her in. But if she didn't, our trump cards are all tipped. This kid said he mailed a locker key to a man named Harry Cassidy. But if we check the hotel, we're going to get the same story we got on the other one. Sure, but... You got an idea? Possibly. Billy Watkins mailed a key to Harold Callan. Gene Shelby mailed a key to Harry Cassidy. Harold Callan, Harry Cassidy. Both phony names. But both with the same initials, H.C. Yeah, I see what you mean. Check your alias sheets, Chief. Nine men out of ten, when they pick a phony name, use a name with their own initials. You 
Say you've had a watch on the uh, Kinsey girl at the stockade ballroom? On and off. Then your boys know something about her contacts. Dig into them and see if you can find a boyfriend or somebody with the initials H.C. What about the kid? He's yours, carrying a concealed weapon. You can book him. Okay. Oh, uh, just a minute. Before we go out there again. What? You said Fats Burton re-enlisted in the Army. That's right. Why would he go back in the Army? He could go to Europe as a civilian, buy up a batch of guns. Yeah, but smuggling the guns into the States would be a big problem. As a soldier, Fats Burton could lick that problem. Soldiers coming home on rotation might get through with a lot of guns for a buddy. Oh, we'll check it. Take a couple of hours. Want to wait around? No, thanks. No, no, not tonight. I think I'll go dancing at the Stockade Ballroom. Marie Kinsey was easy to notice at the Stockade Ballroom. She was hard not to notice. A statuesque blonde in tight slacks. But when you got up close, she wasn't as young as she looked. Come on, come on, you guys. You can't wear overcoats on the floor. Check them. You two busted with a hat. Me? Hi. Hi. Start shedding. Pardon me? The coat. Take it off. I can't check it while you're wearing it. No, I'm not staying. I'm just looking for somebody. Uh, who? A kid named uh, Gene Shelby. You know him? What do you want to see him about? You'll know. Well, doesn't come here every night. He's supposed to meet me here at 8 o'clock. It's 8.30 now. I know. I've been waiting outside and in the lobby. I've got to find him. It's important. So grab a table by the bar and wait. If he's supposed to meet you, he'll be here. Yeah. Is, um... Isn't there any place else I could wait? I, I, uh... I don't like all the people. Why not? Look, um... You've got a chair in there in the check room. Maybe if I came in and sat there... Nobody's allowed behind the counter. Not even for ten dollars? For ten bucks, you can buy the place. Come on. (sighs) Well, this is a little better. Come on, wolves. Off with the camel's hairs. Here. Here, don't forget the checks. See you later. You really hate crowds, don't you? For ten bucks, I don't expect questions. You turned your head away when those guys were checking their coats. I turned my head a lot. I don't want to get a stiff neck. You hot? You ask a lot of questions, don't you? I'm going to get out of here. If that kid shows up, tell him thanks for nothing. Wait a minute. Relax. What's so important about seeing the Shelby kid? What's it to you? I know him pretty well, that's all. I need something. He was going to help me to get it. He was going to introduce me to somebody. Who? Oh. He didn't say. And like a chump, I didn't ask. If I had, I wouldn't need him. He... Wait a minute. Have fun, fellas. Listen, I think I know what you're in the market for. I doubt it, baby. Sort of a uh, noisemaker, if you go in for that kind of a party. Hmm. You're pretty smart. Yeah, not. Anybody to know you were hot to look at you. Who cost you a hundred bucks? Shelby said fifty. A hundred. Yes or no? Yes. Let me make a call. Now, wait a minute. No call, no merchandise. Um, go ahead. But I need this thing right away, tonight. No good. I need it, I tell you. You can have it the day after tomorrow, no sooner. Don't make up your mind. (sighs) I got a big choice. Make your call. Marie, I got a customer. All right. I got it. Hundred. Yeah. Bye. You got a pencil? Yeah, here. No, you write it. Harry Callan. C A L L E N. Hotel Walton. Can I go over and see him tonight? You don't go see him at all. Go to the depot, five blocks from here. Put the money in an envelope. And then stick it in one of them dime lockers and nail him the key. It was the same setup. Whoever her partner was, neither of them would come out in the open to be linked with the guns they were selling. I left the stockade, switched taxis twice to make sure I wasn't followed, and headed for police headquarters. 
By the time I got there, I had a plan. And the chief had some information. Looks like your queries about Fat Burton paid off, Mr. Wellman. What'd you get on him? Here it is. Walter Burton, drafted October 16th, 1943. Member of the draft board says that Burton offered him a bribe for deferment. Huh, sounds like a real patriot. Now, all of a sudden, he starts to miss the uniform and goes back to enlist. Yeah, fishy, all right. Get an army report on his assignment? Yeah. Being a volunteer, he requested the assignment he got. He's in the quartermaster corps. Port of embarkation. Great. Ha! Rotation troops at his fingertips, and half of them are lugging souvenirs. He must be picking up guns like jelly beans. What he can't get from them, he'll be buying from hungry civilians. Not every soldier that comes through there lives in this city, you know. They don't have to. Once they get to the States, they can mail the guns to somebody here. You've probably got dozens of them doing it on every incoming ship. They don't know his game. How about those initials you were checking, H.C.? There we hit the jackpot. Marie Kinsey has a married sister. Her husband's name is Herb Collier. That time? Like a dream. And I know how we can nail him. How? The man's going to sell me a gun. I'm going to put the money in a locker at the depot tonight and mail him the key. He'll pick up the letter at the Hotel Waltham sometime tomorrow. And we stake it out? Right. You put a man on the desk at the Waltham. Get your lab crew to set up a motion picture camera behind the desk, someplace out of sight. Right. I also want a camera set up in the depot to, uh... Get a film on him when he opens the locker. Well, that still isn't evidence. Just a man picking up two envelopes. No, it's a link. There's more to the chain. Don't forget, he has to plant the gun for me in another locker. Have him followed. And we'll get shots of him carrying the package the gun is in. We can blow them up for close-ups later on. Then we can get shots of him making the plant in a railroad locker. Well, that's going to be a tough camera setup. There are a hundred lockers there. How are we going to make sure our camera is trained on the right one? By keeping 99 of them locked. We arranged the camera setups, got shots of Herb Collier, alias Harry Callum, making the money pickup. We tagged him all the way, but at the railroad depot, while we waited for him to turn up with a gun, we ran into trouble. Now boarding at gate three. There's the signal from the boys on the ramp. Camera's all ready. Now all we need is Collier to turn up. Oh, it won't be long. My men reported by phone. Collier left his house 20 minutes ago and picked up a package at a warehouse between his home and here. Good. Must be using the warehouse for storage. <laughs> Probably got a man there working for him. We've got the address. If, uh... Hey, there he is now. Where? Coming down the stairs by the clock. Oh. Tweed Topcoat. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'd better not stand here. You drift that way and I'll... Uh-oh. What's the matter? Woman going down the locker line there looking for a box. We've only got one open. She'll close it. Better stop her. No time. It'll look funny. But we... Uh, 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 Give me a key. Give me a key to one of the boxes we locked. Yeah. Take your choice. What are you going to do? Open it for him. He doesn't know me. I'll pretend to take something out as he comes along. Oh, we've got to change our camera angle. Uh, Get up to the ramp and tell your men. I'll give you time. Get going. The woman had placed a package in the one open locker as I came up to the boxes. Herb Collier wasn't ten feet away from me. I found the box that matched the number of the key I held, and I pretended to be having trouble with the lock. Collier walked slowly through the aisles, looking for a vacant locker. He passed behind me. You, uh, trying to get that box closed or open? Trying to open it. Key sticks a little. You want the box? Yeah. Lock's kind of stiff, I guess. I may need a little oil. I'll have it in a minute. Half these things usually empty. Yeah. Yeah, Box open on the whole roll. Well, you can have this one in a second. There. There there it is now. Help yourself. I thought you had something in there. It's empty. No, no. I just took this ring out and slipped it on my finger. Oh, I didn't notice. Well, it's clear for you now, anyhow. Just stick a dime in the slot, shove your package in, and and lock it. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, I think maybe I'll keep the package with me. You mean you don't want the locker? I changed my mind. Too bad, Collier, because I want to look at that package anyhow. Throw me, cop! Keep your hands off! He dug inside his coat for a gun he was carrying, one that was loaded and ready for use. I caught his arm just in time, and the shot ricocheted off the marble floor and tore into the metal locker. The men we had planted in all parts of the station poured towards us. By the time I wrestled him to the floor, they were on us, and Collier was handcuffed. Let me go! Let go of me! All right, Collier, just take it easy, and you won't get hurt. Better have your boys keep those people away. Pete, Monahan, calm them down, keep them off. 
What kind of a frame-up is this? It's no frame-up. I'd say it is. I was passing through here, you opened a locker, and then you shoved a package in my hand and pulled a gun on me. That's fast thinking and a good story. Well, all right. Well, it's up to you to break it. We can smash it wide open, Junior. We've got motion picture shots of you carrying that package. And when we open it, maybe we'll find your prints on the gun that's inside. That isn't all of the picture either, Collier. Yeah. We've got shots of you picking up a letter in the name of Harry Callan and taking money out of another locker. I don't know what you're talking about. All you got on me is carrying a concealed weapon. I didn't pull it until you jumped me. Don't be coy, Collier. There's a bigger rap than that. This is a federal case. It's, it's a state rap. If it was, I wouldn't be here. The police aren't taking you, Collier. I'm taking you on a government charge. Illegal sale of weapons. You can't prove it. I can try. Chief, put out a pickup for Marie Kinsey. What do you want Marie for? I want to take her to a movie. Private one. Starring you. She won't tell you nothing. She might. Women don't like prisons, Collier. They don't like to age too quickly. We showed Marie the shots of Collier making the pickups, and she started to crack. We read her the law on the illegal sale of weapons, the law and the possible penalties. Just the facts. It was all she needed. I never touched the gun. It never went through my hand. You're an accessory, Miss Kinsey. I didn't know what he was selling. That won't stand up. You knew what I was buying, and you made the same kind of a deal for a kid in a cell in there, Gene Shelby. Don't you realize that kid might have killed somebody? He just wanted to use the gun to scare people. And so did Billy Watkins, until he got in a tight spot and murdered the owner of a liquor store. Yeah, but I mean for that. I didn't know the Watkins kid. No, but he got his gun through the same source, through Collier. Fats Burton told him how to buy it. And now Fats is in Europe sending more guns through, isn't he? I don't know. You may be able to make it easy on yourself, Marie. The government won't make any deals with you, but... Judges are inclined to look at all the evidence. Sometimes they're a little more friendly with people who tell the truth. All of it. She gave it all. Names, addresses, and the roundup started. More than 20 men in 20 key cities. Men without conscience putting murder merchandise in the hands of crazy kids. Kids in hot rods. Kids who thought that guns and whiskey and marijuana made them bigger than society. And when we got the sellers, we got the list of customers. Enough to make you sick. Enough to make the whole country sick. Oh, hello, Mr. Wellman. Ah, hello, Chief. Well, the last of the gang has been picked up in Miami. Yeah. It's all over but the trials now. What about Fats Burton? Under military arrest in Europe. The CID boys got him. Hmm. Almost seven weeks for you. You must be knocked out. I am. Understand the Billy Watkins case went to the jury today. Uh, it didn't take long. They're back. It's over. Murder in the second. He'll draw 20 to life. Mm. An 18-year-old kid. Yeah. Well, maybe because of this, there'll be less of them from now on. <laughs> This is Douglas Fairbanks again. The smashing of the illegal weapons ring closes another chapter in the distinguished chronicle of our silent men, the special agents of all branches of our federal government who daily risk their lives to protect the lives of all of us. Next week, we will tell you a story involving heartless dealers in human contraband in the file case entitled Visas for Sale, another venture undertaken for our protection by... The Silent Men. The Silent Men is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's case was written by Joel Murcott and transcribed in Hollywood. Only the names and places were fictional. Featured in tonight's cast were Stan Waxman, Jerry Farber, Glenn Vernon, Gene Tatum, and Bill Yeagerman. Your announcer is Don Stanley. Douglas Fairbanks will shortly present Betty Davis, Gary Merrill, and Emlyn Williams in the motion picture Another Man's Poison. Listen again next week and every week to other exciting adventures involving the law enforcement adventures of the special agents of our federal government. For they are the silent men.
Now, here's a holiday wish from the NBC Chimes. Happy holiday, happy listening, happy holiday, happy listening, NBC wishes you a season of good cheer, a merry, merry Christmas and a happier New Year. Happy holiday, happy listening, happy holiday, happy listening. Now, Tales of the Texas Rangers on NBC. Welcome back. Well, a nice little Christmassy uh, jingle at the end. Uh, but it would take more than that for this episode to land on one of our Christmas uh, plays. Probably at least something in the body of the episode. But I can definitely understand, you know, why they did not have that sort of theme with uh, this week's show. It was kind of interesting at the end where it was almost like the federal agents outsmarted each other with the whole setup of only having the one locker open and then just some random woman foiling their plans by... Uh, getting into that one specific uh, locker. And yeah, you could tell the uh, criminal was suspicious to start with because of just not being able to find, you know, a single open locker out of a hundred. That's kind of unusually busy. And then our hero made him even more suspicious. But as it turned out, this was some nice evidence to have. Would be great if they had the picture. Uh, but it wasn't strictly necessary. So even though they kind of outsmarted themselves, would it have made sense to have two or three different lockers just in case? And of course, you do wonder how this would play out today with all the camera technology. I would imagine it would probably be a simpler setup just because... Not only do you have the ubiquitousness of cell phones, you also have a lot of uh, closed circuit television, which might be in an area like this anyway. Though, of course, the presence of closed circuit television might uh, force our villains to come up with an alternate uh, location or means of getting the gun to their fire. Well, now I do want to go ahead and thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Robert, Patreon supporter since August 2016, currently supporting us at the uh, Detective Sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Robert. And that will do it for today. Join us back here on Monday for Casey Crime Photographer. And then we will be back next Saturday, another episode of The Silent Man. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.